we are at the top of the hour, sir. Hello. So Welcome. Hello. Now, now, Mark, if I could preface this for everybody, Mark gave me a laundry list this tall. So, so he's been, they've been going into crazy mode. I, I have Aiden Schaefer with him. Now I'll, I'll have to start. Aiden is becoming a regular in Mark's lab. So I'm going to have to start adding Mark to the, Aiden to the write up with Mark. But you guys, I, I don't even have it memorized. You know what? Give me a second. I'll take a look at the, uh, so you, you're working on a ton of projects right now. It's, it's really amazing. Um, let me see. We're talking about, okay. So vapor, vacuum vapor depth, which is. We're actually working gonna, on it right now. We just got it hooked up and we're pulling a vacuum and just turned on the diffusion pump. Um, that, the system's right behind me. It, it, and if I could jump in, before I hand this over to you completely, you guys are replicating arts parts. I just realized, I, I'm not sure if I'm the person who could help with this, but that would be coast to coast AM worthy material. We, we should try. We should try and get you on coast to coast with that and say, look, we've replicated it, especially if you're getting results. If you have videos to demonstrate with that, I mean, that would be a you know, national audience. So, Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, the arts part sample amongst others, uh, when I was looking at it uh, in, in light of the uh, work with the Alzafon experiment with the EPR trying to orient the subatomic particles uh, in the core of the atom, uh, there's a problem with the uh, high frequency uh, that we're using has a very low skin depth. So the RF is not able to penetrate the sample very well. Uh, with a sample that is made up of basically a parallel plate capacitor on a uh, nano scale, where you have a metal and then it's oxide and then another metal, that's basically a, a parallel plate capacitor. And each um, each uh, metal layer will, will then have uh, its own skin depth and would allow for you know, deeper penetration into a sample. So do you, do you think arts parts actually is part of Alzafon then? It's possible. It's possible. I know Hal Putoff claims that it was Terrorhertz waveguide, but, um, and then that's the new red herring. We don't have the terahertz, you know, equipment, blah, blah, blah. We can't do anything with it. But you know, chicken little sky's long. Um, but uh, I'm looking at it. You know, maybe maybe it'll work in an EPR machine and you know produce better results. We have seen the best results with Alzafon we've seen were with uh, thin film uh, aluminum deposits. So I'm thinking thin film, oxide thin film, oxide thin film. Different materials can eventually get us uh, there. Is, is that the picture of it? That's the side layer. Yeah, that's the side. So. You can basically see it's uh, metals with oxides and a parallel plate capacitor sort of design yeah. um, that we're working on. Um, we built this massive uh, clean room over here. I'll just show you real quick. Uh, so this is in the corner of the lab where there used to be a, a table in the corner. And now it's just a clean room. Um, we're literally we're putting in the uh, hoses for it during the conference. I was out at Home Depot earlier, um, getting the air hoses and parts. So it literally is just coming together right now. We might be able to uh, vapor deposit some gold in a little bit. The machine came with uh, gold on the filaments. So we might be able to do some uh, vapor deposition of gold um, in the next hour or so if, if anyone wants to stick around. Um, also, Aiden Schaefer has been working on uh, his Manelis device. You wanna show them that? Yeah. Here, yeah, well, let me hand this thing over completely to you. I'm sorry for butting into your, sorry for butting into your presentation. I'll, I'll put myself on mute and I'll disappear into the background, sir. I'll bring that forward. I'm going to bring the back into this. Let's see. Uh, how well can people hear me? So so good. Yeah, you you sound pretty good. Okay. Um... So the Manilis device is, you know, I learned about it through Tom Vallone at the Integrity Research Institute uh, and his, his conference on future energy. Um, it, it is heavily based off of the Bedini schoolgirl circuit, uh, which was shown to like, it, it would, you could run it off of a nine volt battery. Uh, I had uh, the original one he was using you know, these, these jewel thieves, which this is a, a replication. It's a, a ferrite rod. Um, 
you know, it's, there's two, two coils. Uh, one's the trigger coil, one's the power. And then the midst of uh, fabricating uh, the, the circuit. Um, so in the heart of the Bedini schoolgirl circuit, um, they have a, a solid state device, or no, excuse me, a, a mechanical device where it's a, like a wheel with a bunch of magnets on it um, with the north side facing out. Um, the original, the first battery, like you give it a kick and uh, you get enough of a, an impulse off of these the jewel thieves that it will uh, feed back some energy back into the battery. Um, so Arthur Manellis went through and he actually, uh, this, this is unconditioned or degauss ferrite. This should be showing pictures or a color. Um, it's just staying boring and gray. Um, so he conditioned the ferrite, these, these large slabs, uh, using knowledge of the game through Floyd Sweet. Uh, and I've been talking with some of the, the researchers on it. And uh, the key word here is Magnon, uh, M-A-G-N-O-N. And um, there's this second sound phenomenon uh, which is where the thermal electric conversion is coming from. Um, so Arthur, basically, I don't, we're in the midst of doing it, which you can see is this large chunk of iron. Uh, here's a magnetizing coil. Um, so you have to basically degauss it and then uh, you repolarize it. So it's, um, you know, north would be on the outside and then uh the while you're doing that um you have this high voltage coil and you're putting a toroidal field spinning into it uh i've heard from some people that uh dr valone has uh keyed me into that uh, they may have had some sort of success with it uh it's very noisy um so i said well why don't we you know, this is my function, well, not functioning, but um, switched over to a circle. Uh, I'm, you know, studying flying saucers and we've got to learn to build on the round. Also nature uses circular geometry. So uh, what, what this monster is, is a uh, work in progress in that um, we've got huge coil um, oh, I got to be careful. <laughs> there, right? Um, have over the last week learned how to recondition ferrite uh, thermally, excuse me, degauss it thermally uh, using um, some knowledge I gained from foundry work. Uh, if anybody's taking notes, like you basically you let it soak at two to 400 degrees for a couple hours. And then I uh, did these 200 degree jumps, you know, so, you know, 400 to 600, let it sit for 90 minutes, 600 up to 800, let it sit for 90 minutes. Uh, and then uh, around 880 degrees is its Curie temperature or, or Neil. I think they're, sometimes they, they inner switch. Curie is what I understand. So the Curie temperature is when um, basically the stored magnetism, uh, there's enough uh, thermal energy in, in the ferrite that it becomes uh, non-magnetized or no longer polarized. So talking with Mark, uh, we figured that this, this kind of setup, um, we still need to do some fabrication on it, but uh, the idea is, uh, this is probably too thin. We've got some custom barium ferrite in, uh, in process over in Europe. Um, they'll end up being three inch discs and no hole in the middle, but um, so it'll go in here or on, on here. Uh, we'll give it a whack and we'll try to develop, um, get, get it so it's like south, a southward pole on the inside and a north pole on the outside. It's basically like a scalar magnet for 
think of a scalar electric field where it's, it has no polarization other than to the outer space. Uh, a magnet like that would be almost polar uh, scalar, except that it, it is on a flat field. If you make it round somehow, mm -hmm. put a whole bunch of them together, we could probably build a true scalar magnetic field. Um, so on this, when I have it finished, uh, this this piece is just keeping the ferrite and the bismuth. This is just a leap of intuition, putting the, the ferrite and the, um, or the bismuth inside of it. Um, thinking about Bob Lazar and the, like the element 115 and how it's like the densest element within the vehicle. And it's in the center of the vehicle in a special shape. So I said, well, you know, why not? Um, let's throw bismuth in there. Uh, it also might help keep the, so spin wave, this is where I, I will come up with a presentation here after we do some experimentation. So magnons and spin wave and second sound, those are key words uh, for this research. Uh, once you get into the second sound um, jargon, that's where you start seeing the physics for the thermal electric conversion. So the second law violation, second law of thermal dynamics violation is um, in progress, <laughs> shall we say. Um, so it's the spin wave, the mag, once it's alive, alive or uh, energized, and I have the magnon going through here, uh, the first set of coils keep that alive. I still have to wire up and create a, a collection coil. Um, and the system, uh, there are some really good books on the Bedini schoolgirl circuit, but basically uh, another intuitive leap is that the coils, once they're charged in combination with the diodes, um, they, they act as a, a capacitor diode filter ladder and they keep the waveform centered. So that's why there's five. Uh, you could do seven or nine. It has to be odd in order to keep the waveform that's coming out. Uh, the, second, the, the second sound phenomenon runs up at a over 180 volts. Um, that was, or, or the, the original Arthur Manellis uh, circuit, it, you know, that's also part of the job of the, the coils is to bounce the input voltage and get it up to the 180 volts. And that keeps the spin wave going. Um, with spin waves and magnons, the current research is going towards the very, very, very small and using like waveguides and whatnot. Um, I think the other, you know, for power generation, uh, you go into big bulk substrates, uh, or bulk uh, chunks of ferrite. Um, from the technician notes, uh, barium ferrite repolarizes uh, easier than uh, strontium ferrite. It's strontium hexaferrite or barium hexaferrite. Uh, the hexaferrite structure is at the 100 nanometer wavelength. And um, from the original presentation by Dr. Ahern, he was suggesting that the, you know, if you got this stuff ground down to like the 3 to 10, 3 to 12 uh, micrometer range, um, that that would be. You, that's where you'd start seeing the, the second law of thermodynamics violations. Um, because the, the original device was documented. Uh, Arthur ran his foam off of it for 12 years off of uh, like a thousand pounds of batteries uh, using, I don't know, 12, 25 watts or something of input power. And uh, it was continuously outputting 70 watts of power. So, uh, and it was getting cold in the process. And it was getting colder. And so that's, that is understood within the second sound phenomenon. Uh, it's on Wikipedia and such. Uh, basically, um, it would be like a thermal electric conversion device, it, turning on an air conditioner and producing electricity. Well, yeah, it's so the, the wave, the, you know, I, I, my personal feeling is we're in the realm of quasi crystals. Um, 
if you look at you know ice and phase changes and the, the spin wave that's going on in here you know it's a moving phenomenon and it's trying to become more organized so that is uh, having an exterior near field effect on uh, the random chaotic motion that's you know uh, sorry I don't have graphics and all that I've got finger magic but um, so we're, we're getting there I guess in another week or so not, not, well yeah over the next week we'll be playing with that you have to machine out some of these parts we got them a little extra long so they're going to be machined down for different magnet sizes um, Three separate center rods. That's where the match is going to happen. It looks like they. Uh, well, that's part of this. this. Yeah, it looks like they, they sent us a second one. We, we had a. We have a. I think I won the bet because um, everybody was saying that this whole device was going to be like way over 200 pounds. And I'm like, oh, I have an anvil at home. It's like, I can't lift. That's a 200 pound anvil. And, that's pretty heavy. Right? And no, I weighed it with the coil. It's at 66 pounds. And my original estimate would be uh, that it was under 80 pounds tops. So. Uh, Mark owes me a shot and a beer or something. <laughs> um, uh, the next thing is uh, so that's that's uh, the Manila system. I'll show it in another couple weeks here, probably July or August. So this is uh, a big acrylic tube that we got, um, and we are going to be replicating the um, Podkina impulse experiment. Basically, we got a superconductor that's going to be hanging around over here. Of course, there's going to be an end plate on it, which I have over there. There's several end plates for various configurations. So there's going to be a superconductor over here with a copper pipe feeding liquid nitrogen in and a uh, vacuum. And then there's going to be a uh, either copper or silver block that it's going to be handing into. Be feeding it with a million volts using our megavolt marks generator over here. Oops. There we go. That just fell down. Yep, there we go. The, the megavolt marks generator. Uh, that's what happens when the wires are. Yeah, using the megavolt marks generator. And apparently it's supposed to create some sort of uh, gravity impulse field. We've tried this before without the vacuum chamber. Uh, it was a pretty exciting experiment. Uh, Jeremy and Jeremiah were there actually for that last uh, attempt. Uh, this time we're going to have a high speed camera to uh, see if any magic happens um, with up to a million frames per second. We're probably going to have to drop that down to like 250 or even 100,000 to get any decent um, uh, pixels. Um, also, there's going to be massive Helmholtz coils that are going to be going around this uh, 26 inches in diameter. Uh, they're still being built. Uh, we'll be using a uh, massive garbage can that I got from the uh, Home Depot gardening department uh, as our bobbin for that. Uh, so two massive Helmholtz coils are going to be going around this device, this thing, creating a homogeneous magnetic field that the uh, uh, impulse is going to follow. It should be like laser-like down the tube, and uh, we'll see any effects out the other side. So uh, solid half-inch acrylic. That's, that's for the uh, Podcloth Impulse Experiment. Um, this might be happening more like in July. Uh, I know Todd Seattle plans on coming down and uh, sometime in July. So stay tuned for that. The clean room has been, yeah, it's, we've been working on the clean room. That wasn't, that wasn't there last week. <laughs> so uh, it started on like Thursday ish, Wednesday, Thursday last week. Um, no, it was a bit. Well, anyway, within two weeks, it's uh, called oh, two weeks of effort. Uh, we've got this. Uh, we've got two little holes left to seal. I was shooting for class six, but I, you know. We might get there. We uh, might. The vacuum pump is actually running its first cycle since we got it. We literally just hooked up the air during David Perez's uh, presentation. It's right now down to uh, 10 to the negative 5 tour. Uh, we might get it down to 10 to the negative 7 if we add uh, liquid nitrogen. Um, the system is 
is set up right now to vapor deposit gold. That's just how it arrived. Um, that's what the previous owners were using it for. So uh, we may deposit some gold just to uh, try it out in a little bit. Any questions? Oh, I, I forgot to mention oh. Uh, oh, you're the book. Uh, if you get this book, this is really useful. Um, now, it's, there's some other books that this needs to be used with in combination, but uh, the, what you're seeing on the cover is a uh, waveform being refracted. So this is like a negative index, uh, positive. So all sorts of terms in there. Useful book. Oh, oh, one other thing that we, uh, we got going on here at the lab. So um, Todd had this idea of making uh, split ring resonators using the vapor deposition uh, machine. And uh, we got a, a art printer. It basically can cut different materials. Um, uh, over here, we cut this, uh, it's basically black tape, paper tape in the shape of a, uh, crop circle that represents pi, actually the, the differences between the, uh, the little indents are the uh, a rep representation of the number of pi. This was from back in 2009. We're sticking that on the wall over there. We also have the Falcon Space logo that was cut on that. But what we're able to do with that, more importantly, is um, vapor deposit. We, if we're going to be making parallel plate capacitors, we don't want them shorting out on the edges. So we're going to have uh, we're vapor deposit a large area, then we'll uh, do a uh, an oxide layer. Then the, the next metal layer will be a little bit in, and we'll make the ring using this printer as a stencil to uh, keep it, you know, sort of tapered upward. And then we'll cut out the, the uh, actual material from the center, just the way we keep everything separate. Um, another cool thing what we're going to be doing for oxide layers. Uh, got heat lamps. Uh, they're still in the mail. They're like uh, food grade heat lamps that you see at ShopRite heating up chicken. So uh, those kind of things. We've got four lamps coming in for a total of a thousand watts of infrared light. And it's all going to be centered on this six inch diameter uh, turn plate. And we're going to be feeding pure oxygen in there from the center, hopefully to get a, a nice clean oxide layer on that entire sample. And we'll be able to test it for uh, you know, whether it's a true oxide layer, but just putting a, an electrode on top of it very lightly, of course, making sure that there's no connectivity, then we know that we're, we're done, we're ready for the next uh, vapor uh, uh, deposition layer. So that's how we plan on building the arts parts uh, sample, uh, amongst other things. We've got lots of, lots of different types of samples. We plan on vapor depositing silver. Right now we're set up for gold, um, aluminum, uh, Iron, I'm not sure if the machine can handle iron, but we're gonna try. And uh, of course, zinc, magnesium, and bismuth, those are the three layers for the arc parts uh, materials. Very interesting to see what happens with uh, very thin film layers of bismuth in uh, an EPR setup. We know magnesium and aluminum both have very high uh, retention values for dynamic nuclear orientation, which is, orienting the subatomic particle spins using our uh, Ozopon experiment over, over this way. Actually, it's covered by the airplanes that just came down when we were setting it up. I don't know, can you get Drew on? What do you, do you, so Drew, you made a comment. Uh, we're, I've got a couple clean rooms from around Albuquerque. Uh, I guess they're more clean work areas, but uh, Drew in sunny Florida, if you have any uh, suggestions on how to improve it, um, we, we do have. It's not 100%. Uh, that's not, we're not done yet. We've got another antechain or a door to put on the inside. We have flaps right now, but if they keep outgassing, we'll uh, switch over to something a little bit more sealed. Um, the other technicians that have been helping Mark or working with Mark, uh, been teaching Tom, them. Tom Tom. Yeah, teaching them habits over the last couple of days as we've been building it. You know, it's just a mindfulness practice and um, doing what we can. Um, you know, we do have some funding, but we're trying to do this uh, quick and lean. 
Um, I'm sure like, you know, building a real clean room, like I've already said, like we should have, should be much bigger and uh, a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot more filtration and, and such. And then uh, absolutely no wood used, but uh, what you're not seeing is that we've, on the other side, we've sealed everything with aluminum tape and used Yeah, the wood much... is only on the outside. There's no wood visible on the inside. Yeah. So, um, we, Mark has a fabulous network of advisors. So we've had some people that have also had a uh, serious scientific, uh, experience come in and, and he, he offered, you know, we had a brainstorming session of after we got the, uh, the skeleton up <laughs> and sealed. So it's, you know, any, any tips and tricks? Oh, he said he'd, he'd like to do it offline. So, uh, okay. Yeah, we, All right. we, we can do that after the uh, session. Also, uh, David Perez, uh, glad to see you're uh, still alive and with us. This same technique for the vapor deposition, this is the stencil, so this would be the negative. Um, we could put this on the vapor deposition machine and, and make uh, make your fractals out of any material um, and make them layered too. I don't know if that's, uh, that's helpful. Th there's a rumor going around that uh, super thin films of bismuth are super conducting. So maybe copper with uh, a little bit of bismuth on the, on the edge. I don't know if that'll help, but we can try. I think that could be very helpful. You were, you were talking about depth penetration. I've done some uh, statistics on that and the relationship that we found because we were trying to look at different fractal sizes and frequencies. As the frequency goes up, the depth penetration on the material goes down. I don't yes. know if, if you discovered that yourself and oh, running yes. some calculations. Very, very much so. so. I mean, we're, we're in totally different uh, uh, wavelengths here. You're you're at a lower frequency. We're at nine and a half gigahertz with this EPR experiment. So the oh, okay. The uh, skin depth is extremely low. It's oh extremely yeah. Extremely thin. It's in the it's in that high powered microwave book. Um, yeah, there's a chart and uh, there's an, a, an equation for it. I just I, I asked a couple people to uh, give me the number, and everyone came out with a different number somehow. But it was very, very thin uh, for for uh, frequencies of uh, that magnitude. Um, uh, the, the reason why the uh, power grid is at 60 hertz is uh, for deeper uh, penetration in the wires. One of the reasons. Yep. Oh, yeah, Drew said that he's also setting up to do um, paper deposition of the metamaterials. Drew, you want to get on? Tell us about what you're doing. Yeah, Drew, come on. Well, we'll have a meta materials walk off. We're gonna be like Zoolander. Oh my god, that's the book. That's right. Oh, the high-powered microwave book. Uh, uh -oh. no, it should be. Oh, it's right there. Okay. Oh, okay. I I think it will be very. I think I think it will be a giant first. Oh. I think it will be a giant first. Oh oh, and this book, by the way, I took it to a conference on a whim, and the writer of the book was there. Adel. Right. Yeah, he's right there, and I got a, uh, I got a Polaroid picture with him, and he uh, signed it for me. Oh, there you go. Uh, cool. That's a that's a Polaroid picture of him signing it. Let's see, skin depth. Uh, I, I don't know. Sorry, I'm using the equations, and but if we, yeah, we need a better format for like doing sharing some of these. I don't know if that's getting across, but. This yeah. this book is really quite useful. Um, used with caution, but this is a good book. So uh, I don't know. I've been working with Tom and Jatine and trying to get down to like a core, you know, tech, uh, a core of technicians' equations or literacy, the basic practice of literacy. The camera's up here. I put the screens down there, but. It's just been, um, I've been here for a couple of weeks working uh, nonstop. For me, this is, uh, <laughs> I enjoy it. It's 
I've been, you know, I tried to get into Area 51 politely while I was at UNM, so it didn't work out because of whatever situation. But um, the knowledge I gained in the Albuquerque in engineering environment um, and just my natural handiness from my ancestry has uh, helped Mark quite a bit, you know. So, uh, I don't know. What are you doing, Mark? Oh, he's getting some stuff. Um, yeah, right now, like, it's just pretty much unplanned. Um, if anybody has any good uh, suggestions or anything, I see I'm setting up a... You know, well, I, once you guys get the vapor depth in place, right? Yep. One, once you guys get that in place, it, it, it would be interesting to see what kind of different substances. And so the, the bismag bilayer, that's, you know, that's number one. And then, and then you might be able to, I mean, I don't know how long this takes, but you could try variations on, on, but you know, variations yeah. on that. Oh, well, there's one, um, it's from the Unlab. I don't know if we should be talking about it. Charles Chase, Garrett Modell, he talked about it, and uh, Jeremy Reese has also gone into it, and like using um, pumping energy from the vacuum and using uh, some metamaterials. Um, the, yeah, some of the stuff in the Unlab presentation was was for air, uh, public release and not. So if you tuned into that one, it was it was good. But you have like metal and insulator and then another metal diode. Yeah. Um, I'll have to go into that. He was playing around with uh, trying to get energy from the zero point and then, uh, you, you know, tapping into the Casimir force. You know, I have, I, I'm my, most of my mind is in, you know, the Magnon research. Um, well, but, but I mean, okay, so then, uh, Tony Robertson has a bunch of stuff for superconductors, right? Or okay. Glenn Robertson. And, and I, I'm sure, I'm sure that's something that's been percolating in his head for years. Right. And so, so that might be something that he, you know, he might have some ideas just off the cuff where it's like, okay, let's try this. And, you know, one of those claims was with Poglinoff that maybe it was the surface layer because it was more dense, you know, yada, yada. yada. So, so you've got some superconductor stuff there. The other one was the the fellow that I interviewed who did the room temperature superconductor. The mm -hmm. only way they were able to get that to work at room temperature was to put it in a diamond anvil. Right. Yeah, that's how you're cheating, though. I mean, that's that's super high pressure. Yeah. But um... but, but what, one of the things I asked him in the interview was I said, well, have you thought of vapor depth to get those atoms as close together as they were? And and he said, yeah, that's something we'd like to try. So, okay. you well, know, yeah. Um, once so there, some research done and out of the way, the I mean, the, the very happy uh, investment. Um, so, if we can uh, make some material samples for people, I, I'm sure we'd love to do it. Um, I'm trying to work with our current uh, the the night shift. Oh, night you know the night technicians and pass on some of my lab experience from albuquerque or uh higher education and, and we're doing uh like i said literacy and, and making sure that they're all uh bringing in notebooks and uh we're having little physics chats um yeah there you go man deepening our madness shall we say well how but, how how large can you make these well, not, not very. Um, the platter is designed for, you know, maybe three inch, three, three inch discs. So, so not very, very large at all. Um, it's significant. But there are CBD machines that you can walk into. So once I found out about that, um, it's one of, one of the ideas I thought of you know, I'm aware of arts parts. It's been floating around for a while. Um, there was a really useful book uh, by that Crandall character. They, they all told the truth. Um, the first half of that, or the first like quarter of that book is super useful. Um, 
and the rest of it, I have no offense to Mr. Crandall if he comes across this, but it's, you know, it's like bench notes and the, the rest of it. But um, so the, anyway, uh, the main point was uh, CVD, they have CVD, PVD uh, machines that can do large sheets, um, like the chamber is big enough to walk into, uh, or they have like some sort of like rotating drum and they're doing multiple things on the inside but so the technology is is there for doing larger sheets and then we would just have to figure out how to uh shape it um borrowing probably from some of the innovation that mr musk has done for uh, the starship and getting the nose cone sections uh he's been reducing the amount of welding that they they have to do um on this uh there's a type of rare welding it's called magnetic pulse welding um so the idea is like you know you how do you get a seamless saucer shape well you know you do a large press and then you still have some welds or join areas um part of well one of my models here You know, we're not we're not playing around with the flying saucer shape enough, but you know I thought about this. I have some notes in the back. You know this is 3D printed. Uh, I might I'm working on getting some more shells printed with this Fortify company nearby, and they have a, a 3D printing technology where they can actually polarize the the metal or the material in it, so you're getting you know, a better lattice forming. Um, like I said, Tim, in the beginning, is this like, it's cloud. Yeah, yeah, no, um, I know there's a lot, man. And the, you know, the, you guys are opening some really big doors too. The, the, the Magnons, so like the, with the Magnon and the spin wave research that I found online, um, the best pre presenter so far is this Andre Chumak over in Austria. Uh, his presentation's really nice. Uh, it's on YouTube. Um, Magnons and spin waves. Just look that up. But like the, I've said it multiple times. I've seen optical cloaking twice, and the, the second time I saw it, it just you know it keyed, keyed me into the fact that the propulsion field is spinning around the vehicle. Um, and uh, a, very, a very nice aerospace mentor is told me in the past that the um the vehicles run cold so you know if we can get the mat the materials correct on here um now do, do you think it was actual cloaking or do you think it was like oh, it, well, it, no no poof gone i the oh the, it it was actual cloaking um my it's so if any if you haven't heard of this website National UFO Reporting Center, yeah. new, newforce.org. Uh, my first sighting was in, uh, it said the 12 year anniversary of it. Uh, May, May 28th, uh, 8.03 p.m., uh, Taos, New Mexico. Maybe May 20, it was the last Saturday in May in 2010. And a pair of, pair of saucers came down and I was with my coworker uh on and he saw him first and he goes what the hell is that uh and they it was two saucers um they you know there was a white mist underneath them and there was all these little objects around them and we're sitting there and my uh i was like hey ray i'm seeing less and he's like yep i didn't see any bright flashes did you nope didn't see anything like shoot off randomly he's like nope and I'm just, I'm seeing there's, there's just the two vehicles now. He's like, yep. So within that, that amount of time of me recounting, that was the exact thing. They, they were gone. They were just like, there's, and the two crude platforms, uh, took, you know, came down, they went over the, uh, hospital taos and then uh about 10 minutes later they were uh the terminator nightfall was coming and they they disappeared into nightfall 
the odd thing about that one is that in uh, Cimarron, New Mexico, uh, the next day uh, there was crop circles, a, a whole bunch of little little crop circles were found in a field. So the the vehicles that which it is a very rare, you know, for me that's totally exciting. Like oh, it's you know, a co-worker saw them and then uh, another person uh, or these crop circles were found in Cimarron. Yeah. Um, I got to find that newspaper because that would really help and I'd be able to know how many I saw. Uh, the second time I saw optical cloaking, it was August 12th, 2012. Was, um, we'd gone down to uh, El Paso, Texas to a in industrial supply uh, place and we we're picking up a giant spherical tank uh, to use in a pumpkin cannon, uh, like a pressure vessel for a pumpkin cannon. Um, and then I was watching and I looked up and I saw this like, it was doing like half circles, like, I, I'm, you know, it'd be, uh, I'll draw it this way, but it would do, it would do like a half circle kind of move and then another half, half circle kind of move and another half circle. And then the yard manager's walking by and I'm like, hey, yard manager, like, what is that? <laughs> and he looks up and he's like, oh yeah, I see them all the time here. <laughs> um, so and where, where was that at? El Paso, Texas. Were you guys near any nuclear materials? production no no just um and that at this point so i've i've thought about it and i've done a lot of let me, let me go through the the story but uh, recounting so i'm watching the single vehicle up there and then two little tiny glowing dots they were flashing kind of like reddish yellow so um what is it, optical aberration due to the atmosphere and that there's there's such a small object that the arc second or the you know i'm not seeing much i'm just getting you know they're twinkling like stars um but anyway these two small objects go around they circle and they hold position at like uh 10 o'clock and two o'clock and then out of like a five o'clock position uh another there's black dot comes out and then it I need I, I've said it multiple times I need to find the right graphic artist to show it but it goes it, uh, my hands doing what it did like kind of came out and swirled yeah you no know, it was a single point and then it looked like it exploded into a swirling thing and then within a couple seconds milliseconds I'm longer than i'm talking but all the parts were just gone and nothing was well the 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 reason i ask is right in the uap reports even in the in the government they were talking about what they call signature management and and then uh the the thing that i noticed was in that uh puerto rico video there was what looked like relativistic effects and so i was almost wondering was it like do you think it was trying to cloak or do you think it might have been like a byproduct of the drive system no, it was, it cloaked. It, my, um, I mean, I, I had a really strong spiritual reaction to both of these that that evening, like we went up onto a, a building. I, like, I couldn't, I had the worst case of vertigo ever. Like, um, but at that time, um, in Ciudad Juarez, you go back, uh, you can look into, uh, the, the maquiadoras, uh, there's, and for lack of a better word, it was a demon. Um, but there was a lot of murder going on south of the border. Like, you know, these young women were just getting torn apart by guys high on something. Um, so there's a lot of like random, really bad murder going on. So my gut instinct is that that little ball the platform that i saw cloak went down into ciudad juarez and they were doing some sort of um you know uh, interference on the negative karmas the negative actions that were happening you know um, yeah that's a strong strong statement that's my personal thing i usually don't go into that part of my my 
feelings on that experience, but um, you know, uh, what did Mr. Mathis say earlier that the, the entangled particles is why, because we know that, you know, the light's coming in, it's hitting the shell of the vehicle and then it's not uh, being reflected, it's spontaneous re-emission. So the propulsion field, they know what frequency the metal is, what angstrom wavelength. So the, they modulate the propulsion field and uh, I guess spin it up, catch the outgoing photonic emission and um, impart some energy and spin into it and push it up either into the UV or, I, you know, the yeah. energy goes somewhere, so. Um, oh, I see Charlie Crawford is here. He had some update. He was building a pretty cool coil. Oh, yeah, the yes, and then we do have another, in, in case you forgot, where were they in chat? They were in chat. Uh, let me yeah, see. Charles Crawford III. Drew, 